Tis the season to get spooky. Hello again, long time no see. Seeing as we're in October, the month of Halloween, it's got me in a spoopy mood and I'm ready to crack out something dark and stormy. The disc is flopping about in there. Jesus fucking Christ. I'm always looking out for hidden gems in the category of fearful and ghastly, especially during this era. And there's something uniquely fascinating about the noteworthy setting of a boat in the middle of the ocean and the potential for interesting mechanics, atmosphere and monsters. The only thing I really knew about this game before playing it was that it was likened to Resident Evil on a boat. And I can dig that, you know, like zombies and waves and shit. And think of all the weird sea monsters you could have in those surroundings. I'm like super into like weird fish and sharks and whales. Whales are my favorite. So imagine all the sea creature enemies you could have in those surroundings. I'd just die of excitement. Or it could just be zombies. Cold Fear was published in 2006 as Ubisoft's first foray into survival horror. If we exclude 1986's zombie. And developed by Darkworks, who themselves had dipped their toes into the genre with Alone in the Dark New Nightmare. It was released to meh reviews and was considered a commercial failure only selling 70,000 copies in its first year. I feel like the 2000s era of horror needs to be taken with a pinch of salt nowadays because it can be a bit janky but it's such an interesting unique distinct era and it produced so many of my favourite games so I'm really hoping here that I found a diamond in the rough that was obscured by bigger game releases rather than a mess deserving of critique and failure. The game commences by following a Navy SEAL group guided by CIA Special Agent Jason Bennett as they board a Russian whaling ship named the Eastern Spirit. Soon after, the entire team is wiped out by something unknown. Bennett sends out a message ordering any nearby vessels to attend and investigate. This is received by the crew of the Coast Guard ship Ravenswood. Once aboard the Eastern Spirit, we follow Tom Hansen as he soon becomes the only survivor from the Ravenswood crew. He teams up with Bennett as he tries to discover the mystery surrounding the Eastern Spirit, the monsters aboard, and how to get out. Tom comes armed for his adventure initially with just a basic pistol with an assortment of other weapons found along the way. And it wouldn't be a survival game if ammo conservation wasn't the key. Gunplay is the entirety of the combat as Tom has no melee weapons and only has this shove move if things get a bit intimate so you need to be very clever to effectively conserve your ammunition. The most effective strategy is the headshot. Regular zombies require destruction of the brain to completely kill them. Shots anywhere else will only briefly incapacitate them, but the standard horror game head stomp is implemented here, of course, of course! So time is of the essence to get over to a zombie quickly to finish them off before they get back up and more ammo is needed to put them back down again. But it's so fun sometimes, they'll just keep swinging their weapon at you for a few seconds without a head, I just thought that was dead funny. The environment can be utilised as well by shooting various hazards to create different effects such as a jet to fire or an explosion or it's, it, it's basically just a variety of fire. But a well-timed shot helps save bullets and looks pretty cool too. But with this style of play, ammo conservation is encouraged but not really necessary. Whilst it is a slight inconvenience to backtrack, there is armories to replenish stocks and searching corpses can help recover supplies as well. Because like, if you run out of ammo, that's it, progress stops. In fact, there isn't really any item management at all, which felt really strange for a survival horror. There's no inventory of items to use in the right context. Instead, any keys or codes or whatever are automatically used when you reach the right door. Health packs are also not an item you can freely use, but they're lying around the ship or in the medical bay. There is a finite amount of healing items, so memorizing their locations to backtrack to is quite a clever mechanic if not a touch tedious. But all in all, Coldfear leans more into an action horror rather than a survival horror in this regard. Further leaning into the action side of things are the actual controls themselves. We do have the classic fixed camera angles of many horror games, but there is a third person view for shooting which I found myself using like a lot. It was easier for people around corners and generally navigating. The only downside is how slow Tom moves in this view. In the normal fixed view, there is a run button and effectively a stamina meter which depletes when used, but in third person, the run action isn't available so you just end up slugging about. It might have worked better if the third person was a default control scheme and played more like Resident Evil 4 or Dead Space. But I was a fan of some of the camera angles displayed when in the fixed perspective. Like here, before being introduced to the enemies and you just see it appear out of the lightning in the window is really spooky. Again, another strange one for a survival horror game is the lack of exploration and puzzle solving. It's a very linear adventure with no map screen or anything to get the cogs wearing. I did get lost a couple of times without a map, but once I figured out the game was linear, I just followed the enemies. 
No enemies, generally meant I was going in the wrong direction. Another indicator of direction was save points. There's no save points that can be used freely, but predetermined ones at story milestones. Dying sees you go back to the last save, but they were fairly regular and this never really became an issue for me. The issue was just knowing that I wasn't going to be able to just stop playing if I needed to for whatever reason, and Anxiety Queen here found that a bit stressful. Your main enemy to fight are the exomutants, i.e. the zombies. They are either weakened or recently deceased humans infected by a creature known as an exocell, which infiltrates the host brain and reanimates them. The exocells properly remind me of face huggers without the face hugger bit. There are a couple of other varieties of mutants. Some can see in the dark, some can become transparent briefly, and some have been test subjects of experiments using the exocells and have become engorged monstrosities that remind me of the tanks from Left 4 Dead a bit. There's also normal human enemies, but that's it for your enemy variety. I was honestly so disappointed. There was a huge potential here for the weirdest looking sea creatures to become enemies. I wanted to fight a kraken thing, or a sea serpent my bob, or just see a shark. There's a bloody underwater tunnel and not a single shark. Wait, this is a whaling ship. Give me a freaking whale. I got dead excited when I walked in this room and this cetacean started writhing and I was ready to fight it, but it just chest burst some exocells and that was that. Also, that's a killer whale. That's not even a whale, that's a ruddy great dolphin. The actual zombies are pretty freaky though. Their eyes glow in the dark and they're not lumbering mindless shells, but they will rush at you and use weapons against you too. Their rush can be unpredictable and just when you think you're safe and you've lined up the perfect shot, they lunge straight at you. Sometimes this can be beneficial though as it can activate a quick time event, which if timed right, will land a critical shot, which can cause massive damage or can even be lethal. I'm not gonna lie, a couple of times the zombies really did scare me. There was some really good jump scares that I just didn't see coming at all. When the scares were effective, it was definitely built by the thunderous tension of the rocking ship. When travelling across the deck, Tom fights against the motion of the downpour and is threatened with being thrown overboard at any moment's notice. There's also sections where Tom needs to avoid the crashing waves or else he'll be pulled into the briny depths. Being able to see the ocean around made it really easy to perceive the isolation of Tom on this ghost ship and drops of water on the camera helped emphasise the reduced visibility that Tom would be experiencing. Things quietened down when entering the ship, but the boat still persists in uneasiness as the creaking of the boat can be mistaken for the noise of an enemy. And while there are a couple of good jump scares, many of the scares are super predictable. Like lots of apparently lifeless bodies on the floor that spring up when you get close that literally never got me once because I'm not stupid. The linearity and expectation of enemies builds on the predictability as you know there's probably going to be an enemy behind a door you haven't been in yet. The lack of variety means a small pool of strategies to implement and combat ends up just being as expected. Tom's demeanour is very relaxed too, which can reduce the tension. He even has a bit of a jokey tone at points when communicating with Bennett. Like, why are you so chill when there's pure xenomorph bastards running about literally resurrecting the dead? The voice acting in general isn't awful, but isn't a standout. Apart from being a little totally off at points, it's perfectly serviceable for a silly horror game like this. The graphics are okay too. The ship is believable, but the setting itself lends itself to muted grey colours. It's very dark as well, which makes it equally foreboding and super hard to play during the day. I really like the weird fleshy room with the giant skeleton guy in the back. It makes a huge contrast to the relative normality of the ship and caught me off guard a bit. But I'm most impressed by the storm physics and the realistic movements of both Tom and the ship. I really appreciate the massive amounts of work that was put in by the developers to create this proper good stuff. Okay, so we're going into story territory now, so here's the obligatory spoiler warning with a corresponding timestamp for you. Bloody lovely. The face hugger majigs were discovered on a nearby oil rig owned by a member of a Russian mafia organisation during their drilling operation. Scientists were brought to investigate these parasites to try and exploit them for use as biological weapons. One of these scientists was Dr. Viktor Kamsky, who soon discovers the exocells can resurrect the dead. He takes his experiments too far, eventually experimenting on himself and turning into this weird skeleton monstrosity. Tom is tasked by Agent Bennett to gather the information and research on the exocells collated by Kamsky, and successful completion of this task will result in his extraction. Along the way we find Kamsky's daughter Anna on the ship and climb the crow's nest to crash into the neighbouring oil rig the exocells were discovered on. The transformed Kamsky rescues his daughter and plans to mutate her to his form and while unconscious she's infected by an exocell. Tom reaches her in time to administer a cure. He and Anna then devise a plan to use C4 to blow up the oil rig. 
This is such a cool sequence, making your way up to the helipad as the scene falls apart around you in a torrent of explosions. So badass. At their final destination on the helipad, they are intercepted by Kamsky. He pursues Anna, but Tom distracts him long enough for Anna to plant the final explosives. As Kamsky is defeated, our heroes board a helicopter as the final explosion occurs behind them, destroying the oil rig. I actually found this a really easy to follow story. The linearity and lack of exploration made it easy to pick out the notes lying around and the general lack of subtext and metaphor made it easier for my stupid ass to comprehend. It's not a deep, meaningful game, but it worked in this context, and I honestly would watch the butt out of a film based on this or something, it'd be dead fun. The final battle begins with you distracting Kamsky as Anna places the charges around the helipad. This took me more attempts than I really want to admit to because I didn't understand at first what I was supposed to be doing, but once I stopped being a dipshit, the final battle was fairly straightforward. The second phase goes against everything you feel will be natural, and you go from trying to avoid Kamsky's attacks to actively wanting him to get you to trigger a quick time event which is the only way to harm him. For a finale, it did present a new gameplay style and challenge and definitely felt like a finale but it wasn't super complicated or hot in the mouth thrilling. And that this ends up being the only boss battle in the game is just mad when I'm on a whaling ship with whaling equipment and could have fought a giant zombie whale. Oh, it's not bad, it's, it's okay. It's structured really simply, it's almost completely linear, it's super short and it lacks any replayability because there's not a lot of exploration and there's only one ending. But the isolation of the ship and the physics of the storm and the fun, easy to follow story do make me glad that I played this. You know, I did enjoy playing it and I actively wanted to play it. Will I be playing it again anytime soon? Probably not. But was what I experienced enjoyable and memorable? Definitely. But I can't forgive the game that took place on a whaling ship for not having a single fucking whale in it! Happy Halloween! My favourite whale is the blue whale and my second favourite is the bowhead. They're both baleen and really big, but tooth whales are really cool too, but not as cool as baleen whales. But I also like sharks and my favourite sharks are the Baskin and the Megalodon. Okay, bye!